fun and games with the arrival van as always. Welcome back to the channel. And on this episode, we are unfortunately not going to get the UPS van to run. We've learned there's a mobilizer on it, so it lets you get to that really exciting bit of getting the screen to work that will never go into drive. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to work on the other van we bought and get that to run because it doesn't have an immobilizer. And then long term, I can strip the bits out of that van to fix the UPS van without an immobilizer and then put some new exciting parts into what's going to be the race, race van, race truck, because I want it to have like 1500 brake horsepower and pull like four and a half thousand amps at peak. So I want it to be crazy fast and still be a van slash truck. So you can tell I'm quite excited about that. Also going to pop the lid on an arrival battery pack and look inside a module just to see what they were doing and potentially why they didn't quite work out. So let's go. This is an arrival van battery pack. As you can see, there's, there's five of them, so there's quite a few. So I have lots of spare modules if anyone wants them. There's 16 modules per battery pack and they are 3.7 kilowatt hours per battery module around the 400 volt nominal-ish. I need to count the cells inside one of the modules soon and just work out what the minimum maximum voltage is of these. Now, these packs are quite complicated to be perfectly honest because they're all in parallel. So every module in this battery pack is in parallel, which is a bit crazy. And every module has a positive contactor, a negative contactor, and a pre-charge, which I think is pretty insane. Now, why do I think that's pretty insane? Well, when you power pack up, you normally have a positive contact, a negative contact, and a pre-charge. Now, with these, you have 16 of each, meaning your 12, rush, 12 volt inrush current is massive because you're trying to shut 16 positive contactors and a pre-charge contactor and then 16 negative contactors. So you end up having to stagger your, your packs coming, or modules coming online. Um, theoretically, I'd probably class each one of these as a pack because it has the contacts inside it. It basically makes its own battery pack in a module form factor. Um, also makes it very complicated and potentially very expensive to make. Now inside here, there's also some other stuff just down inside here in which we have a positive and negative contact here, which I think is for the CCS system as well as a 350 amp main fuse there and another fuse just there. So that one there is 350 amp, which is the one that goes to the CCS. So this would have probably been able to do 150 kilowatt CCS rapid charging would be my rough guess, looking at the amperage of that fuse maybe slightly higher. And this 300 amp fuse here I'm presuming goes out to what would have been the drive system slash motor. Um, you also have a, a set of smaller fuses which come out of these connectors here, which would be for things like charger, DC to DC, AC system, um, potentially heat pump, PTC, all that sort of stuff. And then over here, we have what I think is the CCS control module and the master BMS control module, nice little billet box. So inside each one of these is a slave BMS system. And then there's a master here that basically controls each one and brings each one online separately. One benefit with this system is if you, you can lose a number of these modules, and they can take themselves offline because they have their own contactors and pre-charge and keep going. So from a redundancy point of view, it's great, but realistically you don't need 16 levels of redundancy. You could have just had maybe three levels of redundancy and simplify the system quite a lot. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go and have a look inside of one of these packs and just show you how complicated it really is. Now this is a battery module pretending to be an entire battery pack. Who'd have thought, hey? Didn't think I'd ever see the day. Now. It's 400 volts, it has everything a battery pack has, and I'll explain this to you why. It has a master BMS as well as a satellite BMS, it's all on that big PCB. Now the things I'm unplugging are actually the data lines from the cells below, so that's the three to say 3.4 volts coming up from the cells below that then the battery management system uses to balance the cells and keep them all in check. Now looking closer, you have pre-charge, a pre-charge fuse, positive negative 12 volt and can and HV out on that board. And then on the back here, you have a positive contactor, a pre-charge contactor, and a negative contactor, surprisingly. And it's all gold, it looks like. So a rather expensive PCB with an awful lot going on, but very well designed. Now you have this plastic layer, definitely laser cut as there's some browning around the edges of it. Super flexible, I tried to snap it, as you can see, but it didn't break, so no idea exactly what material it is. It's definitely there as an insulative layer between the PCB and what's below. 
You then have a mica sheet. This is really commonly used in high voltage battery packs in OEM vehicles. I see it all the time. It's an insulator there and it's fireproof. It's a great thing to use. You then have this bit I just ripped off. Not recommended to do that. It is basically a ribbon cable that carries all the data to the battery management system. It has seven temperature sensors and it has little fuses everywhere it's wired into the cells in case a cell went bad it would blow the fuse instead of damaging the battery management system and so the connectors that plug on quite nice gold plated plug into the pcb i do like that idea you then have most positive most negative which i taped over so i don't kill myself as this is at 400 volts and then you have all the cells linked in series but they are 2p so there's two in parallel before they go into series i haven't counted the number of them yet I will do and I'll leave it in the comments below. Now this is a bit of the material that actually gets welded to the cells, laser welded on. I actually just pointed out a minute ago. It's really flexible. It looks like it's potentially etched or eaten out of the base material and it may be, I'm not sure exactly what material it is. Uh, my, guess, my guess would be nickel, but I am not 100%. If someone does know, please let us know in the comments below. That was the first look ever inside a rival module. So you have my UPS van and my original race truck, and ta-da, another van. Well, the guys went back to try and get me some spare body panels for the truck, which they did, and we'll have a look at them in a sec. But also, there was still that van left, and it would have been silly not to take it. Plus, it's highly likely at some point I'm going to crash the race truck, because I am not the best driver in the world, and I tend to push my luck. And if you put me in something that potentially has 1,500 brake horsepower, it's definitely going to go wrong at some point. So having spares is key, considering none of these vehicles are made again. It takes a bit of room, but maybe it'll make a good shed at someone's house for the time being until I need to take the parts off of it. Let's go and check out all the bits I got with this as spares as well. As you can see, there seems to be quite a few spare parts. And from what I've seen, what the guy's got, there's a lot of front left wings. Six to be exact. So maybe they think I'm always going to hit the front left bloody side of the van. Got quite a few rear fenders, front fenders, front ends, single set of front bumpers, uh, and a couple of bits I actually don't know what they are. Now we're going to take this van, going to put it on the ramp, because there's a major water leak on the front of it, as can be seen here. So every time I turn it on, this is what happens. Also, there are no brakes, which is not a good thing. Look at this brake pedal. Where's it gone? Hello? There's no way this van's gonna let me go to drive without brake pressure because there'll be a sensor on the brake pressure to allow you to select drive. So as much as I might be able to get the power up without that, we ain't going anywhere. Now we're gonna get this van in on the ramp, lift it up in the air. We can have a look under the whole bottom of the van, see all the bits and what they do, and maybe get the brakes to work and fix that annoying water leak. There's actually seems to be lifting points just here. Question is, is it stable? Not falling off. Hopefully it's safe. It appears that's the highest I can go in the workshop before I hit the ceiling and I'm just touching the light on the top right so maybe it'll melt the roof. But we'll see, let's have a look underneath this thing. What I can see this is one of the early prototype motors because it's all billet aluminum or aluminium before they went to the cast ones, which I definitely saw at the auction location. Looking up here, we have all the HVAC system, so the cooling system, which has the HV on it and all the coolant lines. And this must be what's leaking because I'm pissing fluid all over the floor. So there's fluid coming out somewhere here, which I need to investigate now and work out. Also the brakes didn't work, so I need to look at that. Now, this battery pack, as you can see, does not look like the packs I bought. So this just says number two on it. So this must be one of the really, really early packs that's completely different to what I bought. So at some point I reckon I have to drop this pack out and work out what's inside it, because I don't even know if it's got the original rival modules inside. We have 70 mil squared John Hoyne connector. It's the probably potentially 50 mil squared connector, which probably goes to the CCS. Some more connections up in there. There seems to be a little VCU just here as well. Load more connectors. There's very little at the back of it. So rear here, it looks like we've got what well, looks like a coolant loop where I potentially it's the coolant feed for if you had a rear motor, because there is motor shaft holes there and there. So potentially there is space here to put another motor. 
obviously my plan is to put two large drive units in here with the inverters removed, which means I'll have to get them in the right position. So I'll probably have to take out a big section of this floor to allow the depth for the motors to fit, but there may be a better option. And this here looks like a box which potentially probably got uh, the DC to DC system and everything in would be my guess because there's positive negative tied to chassis there, some communication, some HV and some cooling. So I'd probably say DC to DCs are within this box along with probably another load of other clever power electronics. I decided I'm basically probably going to have to pull the front end off of this van in order to work out what's going on with the cooling system. A lot of these panels are sort of just held on with duct tape. Which it is. I'm going to have to pop the wind mirror off so I can get this panel off. Yeah. And in theory, I'll pull these out now and see if I can get the front bumper off of it. That is not coming off. I'm sure these are opposite thread on these. I'm sure they are on most cars. You have an opposite thread. Yeah, they are. There we go. Wait. I just did it up. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Back the other way. Thing is, most OEM vehicles, this is opposite thread from what I found in the past. I'm sure someone will tell me in the comments if I'm wrong now. Hey, first win. Question is, now I know which way this goes, can I get it to undo? I think I'll leave that one in, as soon as the bumper's already been cut. Just straighten up a bit. This whole rad pack is loose. And there it is. There's a pipe off just down in there. I got the front rad pack out, and I'm really glad I did because when I looked in here, this, which is the brake reservoir line, was not connected to the APS. So if I started putting fluid in there, it would have been all over the floor. One thing I've also realized is I don't know how you manage to fill this up. Like, it's literally in a stupid place. Anyway, so there's that issue. This is loose. Also, I found this cable floating around. Now this cable has been cut off of the fan. I presume someone really didn't want this to go. Someone didn't want this to run, it seems. In here you have a 12 volt battery buried, so really impossible to get to, and another DC to DC unit, which is really random little tiny DC to DC unit down there. And a fuse and some other bits here, so it's a good job I went in here and found them where they were. Fun and games with the arrival van, as always. So I popped all the wheels off, a bit of a closer look. There's loads of these control modules all over the place. Obviously, pretty beefy suspension, stern rack. Brake lines are all in, so I don't know a reason why the brakes are empty so I'm gonna obviously bleed all the brakes now ABS sensors double wishbone which is pretty good Will really help it maybe become a race van or truck whenever we decide and then the rear same again really beefy suspension double wishbone which is great uh, smaller canopod also these are unplugged plug all these back in hopefully if it actually plugs in if I can get them to plug in hopefully that means the rear brakes will actually work again because currently I have no handbrake at all. Oh it's working lovely. Oh. Basically crack the nipple off, put the vacuum thing on and then just squeeze the trigger. Make sure you don't lose your brake nipple colours, they're pretty important to stop them going rusty and minging over time and obviously proper brake spanner so you don't round these off. See what comes through here. Last one to bleed, hopefully there's enough for pedal, and then maybe in the next couple of weeks I'll get someone on a weekend that can help me out to actually bleed them properly. We've got a bit of pedal, they're not perfect, but actually there is some pedal there, instead of it hitting the floor. Like it did earlier, it just went straight to the floor, non-existent. It actually can't hit the floor, and it is pumping up, which is great news. This is making me really excited, I don't know why, but the wipers and the washers work. Hell yeah! 
and it's making some noise. Look at that. It's now time to try and get this fan throw back in. I'm going to pre-connect this pipe, hopefully in the right orientation, on the bottom of here, and then hopefully it'll go in easier than it came out, but that's not normally the case. Definitely more together than it has been for a long time. So I just spent the last hour trying to put little plastic clips in everywhere. But the front end is now back together. I'm gonna fit this one back in because it's definitely gonna to need towing at some point. I'm not putting the other one back in. Time to shut the walls back on. Now let's jump inside and see if we can actually get this thing to run. Fingers crossed, but I don't have a huge amount of hope, even though I've doing all that work on the front end to get it ready to run. Which is the moment of truth. I have not pre-checked this to see if it'll drive, because I don't know if it will. Um, I've gone and got another key, because I realized there was one missing from down in the passenger's footwell. Obviously the wheels are on, uh, disconnect the rear brakes. Oh, that's a bit of a problem. Rubs. Um, yeah, there's a key needed for down there, so I've got one now. I'm gonna put in just now and see if that makes any difference. In German on there, it, there's a process to doing this, which basically says you need to put this one, this one, and this one within 10 seconds in order for it to work. So let's do that. That one. Then that one. Another set of clicks. And then that one. Now that didn't light up without that plugged in. So that's definitely a good sign. We have screen trying to do something. As of now, I don't really have a huge amount of faith in this working. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, this is not great. That's definitely a new error that I didn't have before. So unfortunately, it looks like we've Got closer on this episode than we have before, and look, we've got everything powered up now. For some reason, we have a stuck in park mode, which I need to now work out what is going on with that. And maybe ask some of my contacts. Um, but you'll see inside the battery pack, you see me do loads of work on the front of the vehicle. So at least an hour, the coolant system's working properly and all that stuff. But I've just got electric vehicle malfunction come up again for the motor. So it's definitely an issue there. I'm sure the wheels have spanned on this vehicle before, but now there is definitely another error think this series is going to be full of bugs and errors and fault finding and loads and loads of fun but please come back for the next episode in the if i can't fix this this vehicle is getting stripped down to bear at which point we'll start building a new kit and system to go back into this vehicle and other fans are doing something funny kicking on and off it's really not happy and hopefully we'll get some with the ups fan on the next episode because i've had some people reach out to me that may be able to help Fingers crossed. If you like what you're seeing, hit that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, leave some comments. I want to know if it should be a race van or a race truck, and I'll see you on the next episode.